A couple of weeks ago, we looked at boilers and what goes into making them. So now we need to do part two. We've got the steam. How exactly do we put it to good use? Hello folks and welcome to Vopley. We're standing in front of our newest acquisition, which is the 7F, which is going to be here for a couple of years with us. With me today is Andrew. He started as an apprentice seven years ago and has stayed with the railway ever since. And you're kind of a man of all trades, a bit of fitting and a bit of boilersmithery. Yeah, do a bit of both. Absolute mad skills. So in the first episode, we looked at Canadian Pacific Spoiler, which is a bullied design. This one is very different. So Take us through, what are we looking at here? Yeah, so starting at the back and working our way forwards, you've got the firebox, which is where the fire bed is, and that obviously boils the water as it's surrounded by it. Connected to that, we have the boiler barrel, which is where the tubes sit. Again, connected to the firebox, obviously you've got the water in there as well. And as the gases flow down there, they heat the water, and then they're expelled out the smoke box, out the chimney. Oh, fair enough, so two different designs, but the same basic thing happening on the inside. Since we got all that kind of hot gases from the fire going through to heat the water, how hot does that fire get? You're looking about a thousand degrees when it's really working hard up the hill. Oh, so hot enough to melt metal then? Oh yes, yeah. If you, if you didn't have enough water in the boiler, you, you'd melt the firebox. Terrifying times. So we've now made the steam. How do we actually kind of harvest it? How do we put it to good use? Yeah, it's a good question. So we harvest the steam by the dome on the top, which is the highest point on the boiler, which is where the steam obviously naturally rises to. And this is a two-stage valve where the regulator sits, which is operated by the red handle in the cab. So as the driver opens that, he opens first valve, and this lets a little bit of steam through to the cylinders to make it a controllable movement. And then the further he opens it, there's a second valve, and that allows even more steam through. And that travels along down the main steam pipe into the cylinders and that obviously in turn drives the pistons. Fair enough, so this valve must require a lot of control and precision metal, so what does it actually look like? Well I can show you, I've got one on the bench. Fantastic. Yep. So here we have the uh, J pipe, which is what the, the, at the top you've got the regulator or the valve where, the face where second valve sits, and then this end bolts the main steam pipe which will then carry the steam along down to the cylinders. So you've got second valve, which is this piece here, which sits on this face. And then you've got first valve. So as, you, as the driver opens the regulator, you've got the regulator rod that's then attached to up here with an arm. And he'll open first valve to expose the two small holes. And then when you get so far with opening the regulator, the second valve will open, exposing the larger ports and allowing more steam through to the cylinders. So this is all, in, in the boiler, this has got steam all around it, and the only thing that stops it travelling to the cylinders are these two valves. This is from the engine that plays Thomas the tank engine, uh, and we've taken this one out specifically to do some maintenance on it due to the faces being scored, and this obviously allows steam to pass by the valve and escape out the, cylinder, or escape out the drain cocks, and obviously ultimately can compress the piston and make it move. So we've taken it apart, machined it, and then we're blueing and scraping it back to being flat and steam tight. So yeah, and now we're in the cab of the 7F. You can see this is the brake handle. So as the driver applies the brake, it lets air into the system and that destroys your vacuum, applying your brakes. You've got the injector. So you've got a clack on, on this particular loco, the clack's on the back head, whereas most of the, well, some designs are on the, the boiler barrel. And then you've got a shut off and steam to the um, injector. Coming this way, you've obviously got the gauge glasses. You've got two of those, one either side. You've got the regulator, which is obviously as we've discussed. So as the driver opens this up, it will come towards the fireman side. And that obviously opens both first and second valve. This is the blower and its purpose is to create an artificial draft on the fire. So when the regulator is shut, the gases on the, in the fire will try and come back towards the crew. So this is opened and there's a ring around the blast pipe and that sucks the uh, combustible gases out the chimney. Um, around this side, again, you've got a second injector. So again, steam valve, shut off and a clack. Uh, you've got a steam heat apparatus, which obviously we use for heating the, the sets of coaches in the winter and that sort of thing. Uh, you've got the trimming valves for the injectors, one either side. So basically when you've started the injector, you have the water running out the overflow, you start the steam, and then you trim the water back so the injector runs cleanly, so it makes it as efficient as possible. This is the baffle plate, and its purpose is it sits in the top of the fire hole door. So when the doors are opened, it directs the cold air into the fire bed and below the brick arch to allow it to mix with the hot air before going up to the tube plate. So it protects the tube plate from thermal shock. 
And the last thing is the reverser, which is like a gearbox on a car. So you've got full forward and full back and mid gear, which is where it's currently sat. So when it's in, in forward gear, steam is emitted to one side of the piston or the other, which obviously drives it forward or backwards. And then you've got the same for reverse. So we've swapped over engines now uh, to show you what's on top of the uh, firebox or boiler. And these are called safety valves. So when the pressure gets too great in the boiler, rather than obviously having a boiler explosion, these are here to release the excess steam pressure. So you've got two of them. So again, one will lift at the set boiler pressure and one will lift a couple of pound higher. So if the fire is still making enough steam, it will have enough for a fallback uh, on the pressure. And then obviously you've got your whistle on top as well. The safety valves essentially are a seat that's compressed onto the, boy, uh, in, onto the ceiling face with a spring and that's controlled with an adjuster which is underneath this cap so you, to increase the pressure in the boiler before the valve lifts you compress the spring so you do the adjuster up so the, the tighter the adjuster is the higher the boiler pressure it will be when it lifts and then you've got a top cap so effectively they're tamper proof so the crews can't screw them down because the early type of safety valves when steam engines were first designed, the crews had a thing of screwing the, the safety valves down to get a bit more power, and there were quite a few um, accidents with them. So these are tamper-proof, they're all as a sealed unit, so they can't be uh, fiddled with in service. It may not surprise you to know that to make steam, you need two things. You need fire, got that, and you need water. Now we need some sort of way to get water from the tender or the side tanks into the boiler because once it goes out the chimney, it needs to be replaced. Now there's two main ways you can get water into the boiler. The first one you can use is a pump which is driven off the motion. Another way is using one of these. This is called an injector. And um, all of our engines here on the Mid-Hands Railway have two as a standard. Uh, you occasionally can get uh, locomotives with an injector and a water pump, just the way they were built. Now these work by using steam from the boiler, firing it into water, and then pushing that water back into the boiler. Now this particular one is a vertical one. Uh, the simple injector looks a bit like this. That's a horizontal one. They do come in slightly different arrangements, but they all have the same sort of thing in water inlet, steam inlet, combining delivery cone and delivery pipe. So, this particular one is on a little engine. No points for guessing exactly which one we have here. And here's the basics of how it works. You turn the water on and you flood the water inlet, which will go through the combining cone and then out of the overflow. That's when you see water coming out of this pipe here. Once the water's running, we then turn the steam on. Steam's taken directly from the boiler, goes through the steam cone, hits the water, the water and the low temperature of the water condenses the steam slightly and they shoot in the same direction. Now, we need to get that steam to overcome the gap and not come out the overflow. And this is where Bernoulli comes into us. If you heard of Bernoulli, you will either love that name or hate it. It's one for those that do fluid dynamics and that sort of thing. But essentially, as the cone gets narrower, the pressure will decrease, but the velocity will increase, and that'll be enough to jump the gap. Now we've got a slight problem. We've got high velocity water, but at low pressure. The, this is the problem because once it gets up the delivery pipe, it goes to a clack, which is a non-return valve, and that has boiler pressure on that side. So somehow we need to make that steam we've siphoned off at boiler pressure overcome boiler pressure. So, reverse Bernoulli now. As the cone gets wider, the velocity decreases, but the pressure increases, and that pressure is more than what's currently in the boiler, and that overcomes the non-return valve or the clack valve and goes into the boiler. And we'll cover what happens if you don't have enough water later on. So yes, cool inventions, and if you ever hear a whistling sound, that's the sound of the water going into the boiler. And, as Andrew's about to display, it's not just any water we put in there. So it might surprise you to know that we use treated water in our boilers, not any old water. And this is the treatment plant. So we take uh, raw water or mains water 
and we put it through the plant which reduces the TDS or total solubles dissolved and controls the acidity level. And then this is pumped up to the brake plate and this is what we use in our engines. The reason we do this is in the same way as your kettle at home, when you boil the water you're left with deposits like chalk and stuff like that, we have the same thing in the boilers and obviously this can cause an issue because it can block passages, it can cause overheating, that sort of thing. So uh, yeah, we use the plant to reduce all of that and uh, keep the levels under control. So we've got a sample that we've just taken off the standard floor and we've got two monitors here for checking the TDS which is what this one blue one is for and it's simply used by taking the end off and just sticking it in and that will tell us the figure of how much is in there. This one here is the acidity level so again we just take the end off, pop it in and that will tell us what that is in the water and then we keep a track of that on the record here so we've got engine number and then obviously the levels of what we, we find. And we've got one final test, which is a tannin test to find out how much is in there parts per, per parts per million. Uh, and this obviously means we can add more or less tannin if needed in service. Uh, tannin is used for uh, controlling the oxygen level within the water, so it stops the oxygen bubbles rushing up the plate work, which can cause corrosion. Um, if we obviously find the levels to be unusually high or anything like that, we can do an extra washout or instruct the crews to uh, blow down the boilers to eject the... Um, scale out the bottom of the boiler um, but yeah we all we keep an eye on it and monitor everything and we've obviously got check sheets for the plant as well to again check the same thing for total solubles dissolved going in and out and obviously the acidity levels as well and there you are guys hopefully there's a few things that you've not seen before and thank you so much to Andrew for showing us about if you would like to see more stuff like that and keeping track of the progress of Ropley works then visit the Facebook page Ropley MPD, set up by the guys here, and where they keep posting updates about general comings and goings at Ropley. Well worth a look. Now I thought I'd take the opportunity before this episode ends to answer a question that was posted online. Namely, how do you tell how much water's actually in your boiler when on the run? Excellent question. The answer is, it's simple with its complexities. The simple answer is you look at your gauge glass. These are fitted onto every engine because we need to know how much water's in the boiler. And essentially, this is our training frame, which we use for training and assessment purposes. There's uh, not much to it. In real life, this will be mounted on the back head, so this would be the cab. Anything behind the wood, that would be the boiler, where the water is. There's two valves, one at the top, one at the bottom. Uh, the top one should be letting in steam, the bottom one should be letting in water because the water level should be somewhere between here. Behind the actual glass in real life, we don't use it because this is a training thing, you will see a plate which has diagonal stripes. Now when the water level gets in front of them, due to the fraction of light through water, the stripes will actually change direction and it helps you work out where your water level is. That's the simple answer. Here's the complexity. There's only one part of the railway which is actually level, and that's just on the London side of Butts Bridge. Here is the problem, as demonstrated by my super amazing high-tech... Okay, it's a water bottle. Imagine for a moment this is a smoke box end, this is the firebox end where the cab and the gauge glass is. Say the locomotive is pointing uphill. Water will get pushed on the back. It will give you a false high reading. Say the locomotive pointing downhill. Water will rush to the front, it will give you a false low. Now say the engine is accelerating forwards. Water will get pulled to the back, false high. Say it's braking, or it going the other way. Water gets pulled down, false low. Say you come to a sudden stop, it will shuttle backwards and forwards. So you have to try and work out where it is. And the honest answer is experience. That's how you tell where your water level is. Firing, you may have heard the expression, firing is an art, not a science. And this is part of that art. I'm using my experience and knowledge to know where that water level is. For example, if I'm traveling up to Medstead, going smoke box first, driver will be accelerating uphill. So that's a lot of that water being dragged to the back of the boiler. So a lovely false high. Now, when he shuts off, it's going to go down a bit because the regulator itself, because it's using so much force of taking that steam through, just by the nature of the regulator itself, it's actually lifting the water level up a bit. Now, this is more extreme depending on the engine. So, 
Driver shuts off, water level's gonna come down a bit. We start going over the hill, water's gonna go down quite a lot, and then he goes over the hill and starts breaking down the other side, water's gonna go down a lot, a lot. So, what happens if it goes wrong? Well, if the water level's too high, it could get pulled through the regulator valve, where the steam normally goes, and go into the cylinders. The cylinders rely on compressible gases, and water is very much not that. Now this is called priming. It can cause anything from a cylinder blowout to hydraulic to damage in general, and generally just, yes, bad things happen. Let's look at the other end of the scale. What happens if the water level gets too low? Now the firebox crown or the top of the firebox is about gonna be here, so you really don't want that water disappearing out of sight. If the water level gets too low, potentially the engine could Yes, very bad indeed. So, what's to stop you doing it? Well, the first safety mechanism is the fireman. I, when I'm firing, should know where that water level is at all times, no matter where you're going uphill, downhill, braking, accelerating, regulators open or shut. That's the first safety mechanism. Second one is the driver. All drivers were firemen before they were drivers, so they have a lot of knowledge and experience, and they know what the locomotive is doing because they're the ones driving it. At the same time, they shouldn't be looking at the water level the whole time because they're driving the engine. It's the fireman's job to maintain that water level. And if that all fails, if the driver and fireman allow that water level to go too low, then your final safety device is this. This is called a fusible plug. Uh, this is actually an old one, and um, here's a slightly cleaner demonstration one. This screws into the top of the firebox. It's made out of bronze with a lead core. Normally, the top is covered with water. Now, lead is used because it melts at a comparatively low temperature compared to other metals. So, if the water level drops below out of sight of a gauge glass and even lower and uncovers the firebox crown, that lead will melt almost instantaneously. It will let steam into the firebox, which is gonna be a quite a big visual and audible warning that something has gone badly wrong. You then need to make that locomotive safe. You need to drop the fire, get some water back into that boiler and try to stop it blowing up. You can also wave goodbye to your firing ticket, probably get suspended and potentially goodbye to your railway career. This is a very bad thing to happen, and it's something we are trained not to allow. Thankfully, I'm not sure when the last boiler exploded. I think it was definitely before my time, but you'll be pleased to know that doesn't happen and you will be safe if you come here and any heritage railway at that. So, there we are. That is how you read your water level. It's simple, you look at the glass, with a lot of complexities. Thank you so much for watching guys, I hope that answered a few of your questions, and we shall see you next time for another episode of Things You Now Know. Going back, you've got the boiler barrel, Ford's even. Go, <laughs> where can we start again? <laughs> <laughs> Take two. Yeah, so starting at the back and obviously working our way forwards, you've got the firebox, which is where the firebed is. Uh, <laughs> can we do that again? <laughs> As he always says, he does one take perfectly and the rest. We went to the boiler shop to have a look at what makes a boiler, yeah? Is that the camera or just what I'm saying? No, you can't see you. we here for a couple of years. With me today is Andrew. He started as a... Damn it. <laughs> 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 this is definitely going to be an outtakes ending episode, isn't it? <laughs>